Good afternoon. Delighted to be with you. Um, as Hank Paulson uh, just said, uh, things are getting much more challenging, but there's hope. That's true of the U.S.-China relationship. It is even more true of the topic that we're going to be addressing over the course of the next 50 minutes, uh, global climate, a town hall getting to zero. Uh, and to be very clear, uh, we're not getting to zero, but um, a climate town hall that says getting to something that we feel like we can live with on the planet felt a little too long, so we decided to go with getting to zero. It's an existential threat for us, but I have to say, and I have to give an enormous amount of credit, not just to the organizers, but also to the Chinese government, that the amount of direction and stagecraft that I've gotten and things that I can and can't talk about is exactly zero, which means I won't be invited back to do this next year, but it, it also means that it's an area that the Chinese and indeed that all of us understand we need to be honest about because we require global cooperation and we require action. So that's what we're going to discuss over the course of the next 50 minutes with two panels, but also with a remarkable interactive tool. We're not just gonna talk theoretically about where global climate is going, but as we discuss the issues, we also have a friend, Professor John Sturman uh, at MIT and Climate Interactive, um, and he's going to walk us through a model that actually shows the impact of various policy levers we can pull on global climate. John, can I invite you to the stage, please? Thank you, Ian. So John, show us your model, show us how it works. Great, so uh, we need to bring it up on the screen. There it is. We call it En-ROADS. And let me tell you why we've been developing these interactive climate policy simulations. It's because research shows that showing people research doesn't work. I know you've all been through those briefings where you see a million PowerPoint slides and nothing happens. So today, you're going to have a chance, and Ian's going to have a chance to save our climate. Right now, you see on the left side, primary energy use, historic data from 2000 till now, and then projection based on standard assumptions out to 2100 with coal in brown, oil in red, natural gas in blue, renewables here in green, biomass and nuclear power on top. And that pattern of growth in primary energy leads to these emissions of greenhouse gases from forestry in green, fossil fuels in gray, fluorinated gases, methane in blue, and nitrous oxide. And that leads us to the catastrophic level of warming by 2100 of over four degrees C. This is not compatible with prosperity or health or civilization. And what we're going to do now is give you all a chance through Ian to see if we can bring that level of warming expected down towards two and striving for 1.5 as in the Paris Accord. Ian, what so, would you like to try? So at 4.1, obviously, we're long Beijing, but we're really short Shanghai and Shenzhen, right? Um, and so we really don't want uh, to be there. Uh, let's throw, to start us off before we get the panel, out um, a couple of things that are already very much in the policy discussion. First, with the exception of my government in the United States, almost everyone out there recognizes that we need to move on coal. So first, why don't we actually uh, move coal production down? Great, so there's multiple ways to do that. I'll click on the coal button and let's try something that Mr. Bloomberg is actively campaigning for. We'll stop the construction of all new coal infrastructure in the year 2025. Watch what happens here. It makes a big difference. We have to keep the fossil carbon in the ground. So by stopping the construction of all new coal infrastructure, Coal production peaks not in 2025, but later because of the existing fleet of coal infrastructure, and then it declines, and we're getting more renewables, a little bit more gas, and a little bit more nuclear to fill the gap, so we're not increasing energy poverty. That took us down five-tenths of a degree C. That's a big impact. Keep the fossil carbon in the ground. Okay, let's go to another one. Um, nuclear power. Great. Uh, so we can certainly increase that. We absolutely can. We're As already we getting China. some. Let's subsidize nuclear power pretty aggressively. You can see that blue wedge gets much bigger. But what happened to the temperature? 
basically nothing. So you're basically saying nuclear power, despite the subsidies, isn't moving the outcome. Why is that? So uh, watch what happens here when we subsidize nuclear. No subsidy, subsidize. You do, in fact, get a lot more nuclear. But what's happening to the green wedge of your other renewables, your wind, solar, geothermal, and the storage to go with them? You're squeezing them out. Standard basic economics. You're making nuclear more affordable. Utilities will stop investing in those other renewables. Not much net change in emissions. So one more policy input before we bring out of the panel. We have Bill Gates coming on after this. So I feel like we should talk about the, impl the impact of new technology breakthroughs on energy. Great. So new technology here means we're going to assume a radical new technological breakthrough that gives us 100% carbon-free energy with no uh, side effects, and it's going to be as cheap as coal. And the breakthrough, oops, the breakthrough comes very soon, 2025. This would be like we had fusion in 2025. No fusion advocate believes that's possible. But you can see it didn't change the temperature very much. Well, maybe the breakthrough just isn't big enough. Let's make it a huge breakthrough. The breakthrough is today, and it's cheaper than coal and gets cheaper over time with learning and scale. You still only get a tenth of a degree of benefit. And, and the reason why that hasn't moved the needle is what? So there's three reasons. First of all, it takes a long time, even if the breakthrough is today in the lab, a long time to bring it to commercial feasibility and then scale it up. Long delays, and in the meantime, you keep burning fossil fuel and harming the climate. The second thing is, you've really squeezed out the renewables further and the nuclear, so the substitution effect is offsetting the benefits of your new technology. And the third thing is, in order for the market to take it at a high rate, it has to be cheaper than coal. But if it's cheaper than coal, you're lowering energy prices, and that leads to a rebound effect. Look at the top line here. If we take out the new tech, you get an increase in primary energy demand. So the rebound effect, the long delays, and the substitution effect limit the benefits even of this magical technical breakthrough today. So let's just bring it to a, a regular breakthrough as it is. We're one for three. We moved on coal, not so much on nuclear new technology. With that, let me call out our first panel, please. Global leaders who are going to talk with us about impact of pieces of energy uh, re and renewable policy that they are moving themselves. Uh, Carlos Brito, uh, the CEO of AB InBev, Sarah Menker from Grow Intelligence, Xi Jinhua, uh, China's uh, chief um, climate special negotiator, and Pablo Issa, the executive chairman of Inditex. Please. Okay, so we'll get from my policy wonkery to some concrete people doing real things. And let me start um, to the left uh, with Carlos. Um, you know, you've talked very publicly about just how committed you are to sourcing a lot more of your electricity globally from renewables. What have you actually accomplished so far? How much do you think it's moving the needle? How optimistic are you about the near-term future? Well, not only we're committed, but we're mm -hmm. delivering on it. So two years ago, we announced that by the year 2025, we'd like to have 100%, 100% of our purchased electricity coming from renewable sources. And in two years, we're already from zero, we're already reaching 50% by the end of this year. Uh, so if you go, for example, for a brand of ours, Budweiser, in the US, for example, it has a symbol that says that every Budweiser you buy in the US comes from renewable sources in terms of brewing. And uh, so we have this already in Mexico, in the US, in Brazil, in India, China, and uh, Australia. So we're getting, we're very committed to it. Um, and in terms of the broader supply chain, I mean, when we think about inputs for your company, we're talking about aluminum, we're talking about water, we're talking about agriculture. How are you changing supply chain? What are you doing on ag? What are you doing on water? Yeah, you touched on a very important thing. I mean, no water, no beer. That, that simple. So uh, sustainability for us is, is our business. It's not just a, a part, an add-on. It's central to our business. So agriculture, uh, most of the water that we use in our business is not in the four walls of the brewery. 80% of it is in the ag business. Because of that, I mean, we, we took advantage of the 30,000 growers and farmers that we have relationships through more than 30 years around the world in all continents 
And we're using now more and more technology and data analytics to predict conditions of microclimate, soil, seeds, and to try to instruct them and exchange best practice so they know exactly when to harvest, when to, 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 to plant, so they can really minimize the impact they have on the environment. How much we support? We have already 10,000 of the, that 30,000 connected to the, the technology in terms of data sharing. And as you're moving forward on these policies, how much support are you getting from the public sector around the world? Are you seeing government saying, this is something we want to see replicated, we want to help? It's interesting you say that because the biggest barrier we have to go now from 50 to 100% on the renewable side is exactly the regulatory side of things. Grids that need to be smarter, uh, governments that need to allow such markets to exist where you can buy, and at the same time, we're not using sell back to the grid. So all those things are things that we have to work together with the governments. And because we're a global company, together with other global companies, we, we sit down with governments and try to see how we can make this a better place. So we're on agriculture right now. Sarah uh, from Grow Intelligence, you talk about a global food crisis that's being brought on by climate change. What are the interactions between agriculture and climate change in your view? Yeah, I mean, agriculture is obviously a, a, a large contributor to the climate change discussion in, in multiple forms. One that Carlos touched on, water. Um, I heard an interesting statistic today that, you know, we all know that 70% um, of water use goes to the agricultural industry, but what I didn't know is that only 7% of that is used efficiently. So there's a lot of kind of space and uh, room to, to kind of grow efficiencies there. But the second is, is diets um, and greenhouse gas emissions due to uh, protein consumption, meat consumption, uh, and the contribution there. And so there's a really large conversation right now around what happens around shifting diets and, and what does that look like. Um, and, you know, if you think of it in the context of new economies, if you take a country like Kenya, where Grow Intelligence was actually started and then we grew to become a global company, per capita consumption of meat is at about 10 kilograms per capita. If you look at China, it's at about 60. And the U.S. is at 125. So if you imagine a world where sub-Saharan Africa, which is also the youngest population in the world and some of the fastest growing economies in the world, start to move to 60 kilograms per capita, what, what does it look like? And so we have to start thinking of innovations not just in, in alternative proteins, but in actually fundamentally changing the way we feed our cattle potentially, uh, because we're also not gonna stop eating meat. I mean, do you think it's realistic that large percentages of the population can be incented in a way that's meaningful to change the diet? You know, again, like I said, the youngest and fastest growing parts of the world are, are consuming very little meat today. And uh, the example I give is, I'm an Ethiopian. The way we show wealth when you have somebody come over is you serve a, a banquet and it must include meat. If you serve one with just vegetables, just culturally, Right? So demand of food is not just about tastes and preferences, it's also deeply about culture. And shifting culture doesn't happen in the span of 5, 10, 15 years. So we have to start thinking of what that looks like. So t to me, it's a mix, it's not a single solution. You, you know, you didn't mention anything about Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger, all the rest. Of That's because it's just not credible, it's taking too long, it's too niche, it's too expensive. Right now, it's too expensive. The cost has been coming down drastically, and so we'll start to make measurable impact in economies like the U.S., but the U.S., as I mentioned, is consuming 125 kilograms per capita, but it's not going to be making that impact in countries like Ethiopia or Kenya or Zambia or Malawi, and so what, you know, that's why I'm saying it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, and we still have some fundamental challenges to, to get around, right? The, the average cow in East Africa emits four to five times more greenhouse gas emissions than the average cow in the US or Australia. So there's a lot that we can do to innovate just to make sure that they emit less. So let's bring uh, our, oh, yes? No. No, okay. I mean, you're a former trader as well, so you're gonna, a little buy recommendation on some of those stocks? Is that we can do that? <laughs> I'm a recovering trader, but okay, I traded right. oil and gas, so no. <laughs> So let's, well, I mean, gas is a part of this, but that's, that's a whole different story. We're not going there. Okay, let's get back to the model. Um, and let's talk about a couple of things we just discussed. Um, first, John, um, 
if we want to boost renewables, um, implementing a carbon price would certainly make a difference around the world. Right. Let's talk about that. So let's bring the model back up on the screen. And uh, there we go. So carbon price. Do you have any idea of how large of a carbon price you'd like, Ian? Um, I'm, I'm going to I mean, $50 is what we generally talk about, but I don't Great. know if you consider that enough. Let's try $50 a ton of CO2. And that matters a lot. Now, this is not a big carbon price. To put it in perspective, that would add 44 cents per gallon to gasoline in the United States, 10 euro cents per liter in Europe, and less than a 10% increase in the price of gasoline here in Beijing. So uh, it, it has a big impact, even though it's a rather modest carbon price, and we're phasing it in over 10 years. Okay, I mean, are you prepared? We had an American presidential debate just now. Are you prepared to get on that stage and say 44 cents a gallon is not a major carbon price? I'm just Not in terms of what the, car what the climate needs. This is a huge market failure, and uh, $50 a ton is just not enough to correct that completely. Okay, let's, let's move one more and, and talk about um, ag and how about reducing methane emissions Great. from ag, uh, so which is really critical. So this goes directly what we just heard from Carlos and Sarah. Uh, if we switch to a more plant-based diet, if we reduce food waste, we're going to be reducing the emissions of methane and nitrous oxide, much of which comes from agriculture. And so let me pull that lever here. This makes quite a large difference. Methane and nitrous oxide are very powerful many times more powerful per molecule than carbon dioxide. So I've got a moderate reduction here, recognizing some of the trends that you talked about, and that matters. We're down to three degrees C. Now, that's still not enough. We're still going to lose Shanghai and Shenzhen to sea level rise. The Gulf Coast of the United States, the Netherlands, Venice is already gone, essentially. And, uh, but we're making progress. We're making progress. We're doing things that seem feasible, that industry can be aligned with. It's not dramatically crimping economic growth. I mean, in that environment with globalization, we can imagine that economic growth is reasonably robust. So let me throw one more at you, which is how about if the world is growing a little bit more? What does right. that look like? So we ha we've lowered the expected warming from over four to three. That means there's going to be less climate damage that harms economic growth. So let's increase the rate of economic growth a little bit here. That's about, I think, 40, yeah, 40 or so uh, basis points per year of additional growth. That's a lot in per capita GDP. And uh, what happens is the temperature goes back up to some extent. This is not because uh, we haven't done a better job on climate, but you still have a lot of fossil fuel in the mix. We haven't really done much on oil, and we have still quite a lot of natural gas, both fossil fuels. So by faster economic growth, more air travel, more travel, more uh, consumption of carbon from food, supply chains, consumer goods, we've increased the warming again now to 3.2. And I think an important point to raise here is that part of the reason we're in such a climate fix is because of the real trade-offs that come from a world that has brought unprecedented numbers of citizens out of poverty. And recognizing that that is not just a one-way street, but is an actual trade-off and one that we're going to continue to deal with in the decades to come. As long as we're still on a carbon-based energy system, that's a real trade-off. What we need to do is get off the fossil fuels as fast as possible. So what else would you like to try? No, I think we're good for now. I want to go to the rest of the panel. Okay. So um, you can see we've really worked through this. Um, let me turn um, to our, our member of the Chinese government, Xi Jinhua, um, who is China's special envoy for climate. And one thing I can say is that even my friends in the United States who are among the most hawkish on China have to grudgingly recognize that the Chinese are doing an awful lot on climate today compared to five, ten years ago. So I'd love to hear, and I think the audience would love to hear a little bit of the top priorities of where you think you're making success right now in the Chinese government in tackling this incredibly challenging problem. Well, the Chinese government in tackling climate change, uh, we used our institutional advantage First, climate action has been linked with the economy, society, environment, health, and national security, and we take them into consideration as a whole. And this enables climate action to be more acceptable to people from all walks of life, and people can participate in it. And secondly, we take concrete actions. From 2005 to 2018, we have taken um, 
steps to conserve energy and increase energy in efficiency, we have increased by 41.2 percent. And we have been developing renewables. Renewable energy as a share of our consumption went up from 7.2 percent to 14.5 percent. Total installed capacity in China contributes to 30 percent and 44 percent of the incremental amount in terms of the cost compared with traditional thermal. Uh, I think renewable energy is very competitive. And also in the process, we've been improving the efficiency of energy um, utilization and efficiency has been improved by 40 percent. And also we have been using carbon sink. Uh, our target is to increase 15 billion cubic meters forest as um, carbon sink and uh, by 2020 our target of reducing 45 percent of the carbon intensity can be achieved two years ahead. Currently, we have achieved 45.8 percent of the carbon intensity reduction target. So we have fulfilled the target in terms of uh, dealing with the climate change. But China's GDP has tripled, and 270 people have been uh, have been lifted from uh, poverty, and uh, we have uh, created 30 million jobs from uh, green industries, etc. So I think in this process, China has delivered economic, social development as well as climate purposes, and only in this way we can um, make further progress. Thank you. So one other quick question, because you were the chief climate negotiator, the envoy for Copenhagen, and of course that didn't lead to global agreement. Paris led to global agreement, but now the Americans have walked away. Given your experience on both sides of that, how, do, how does that make you think about the potential for international cooperation and architecture on climate going forward? In terms of climate change, we can say that China always sticks to the principle of multilateralism in Copenhagen because of different opinions, especially between China and the U.S. because of lack of coordination. So ultimately, we only achieved a limited agreement, but this was not binding. But after that, China and U.S. stepped up cooperation. And first of all, we agreed that we have um, disagreements, but we do not criticize each other in public. And secondly, we let each other know our disagreements. And on that basis, we respect each other's core concerns. And we need to find out a solution that is acceptable to both sides and then to work internally so that we can reach consensus. Ultimately, we can find an agreement which is not the best but acceptable to both sides. I think that's the best result from multilateralism. With the joint effort of China, U.S. and other countries, Paris Agreement was made possible. It was uh, uh, signed and uh, took effect, and the heads of uh, China and U.S. Um, signed and uh, published four joint agreements. According to then Secretary General of the U.N., uh, China made tremendous and fundamental historical contribution um, for Paris Agreement. And uh, in the past, U.S. could collaborate with us, but why not now? I think as long as our core concerns have been respected and stick into multi other issues can be solved too. I kind of want an hour on stage with you, to be honest with you. There's some follow-ups there, but I'm going to turn <laughs> to leave you off the hook for a second. Pablo Isla from Inditex, which, I mean, leading the global fashion retail industry, clearly anything you do is going to have a lot of impact downstream. What is Inditex doing to, for its supply chain to increase energy efficiency? How, how daunting is that challenge? Well, first of all, for, for those of you who don't know, Inditex is the parent company of Sara. Sara is the most global fashion brand in the, in the world. And regarding sustainability and our uh, push for sustainability, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, this is something that internally in our company is coming from our teams all across the world. Uh, I always say that the most important asset that we have in our company is our people their commitment, their passion, and when we announced very ambitious targets regarding sustainability in the month of July, the general feeling in the company was feeling proud of belonging to a company that was taking care about sustainability. We could talk a lot about this. I would like to focus on three areas. First of all, energy, uh, two elements. The first one is that we have a commitment to, to 
for our energy in the year 2025 coming from uh, renewable sources. And at the same time, we have developed a new concept of a store that we call the eco-efficient store, that is a store that is consuming 20% less electricity, 50% less water. It is a reality in China for all our stores since last year. It will be a reality all across the world this year for Thara and for the whole group. It will be a reality next year. So currently 90% of our stores in the world are eco-efficient. Second, regarding the supply chain that you were mentioning, well, we are working a lot. We know that being a global leader in our sector uh, means that we also need to lead in terms of sustainability. In July, we announced very significant uh, and very ambitious targets in terms of sustainable raw materials for 100% for linen, for uh, cellulosic fibers, uh, cotton, 100% uh, uh, recycled polyester, all these uh, commitments for the year 2025. And at the same time, working permanently with our supply chain to be more sustainable from every point of view. Uh, for example, we developed with the chemical industry what we call the list that was our standard about what chemical products could be used in the manufacturing process, and now this is becoming an industry standard. And at the same time, working very seriously in everything which has to do with reutilizing, working with NGOs all across the world. For example, something very specific, uh, we began in, in Spain, uh, Shanghai and Beijing, and now we are expanding New York, Paris, London, the possibility when you order online, we take back, if you want, uh, garments that you don't need anymore, and also working in recycling, particularly with the MIT. Now, you said some of these are becoming industry standards. Yeah. In relatively quick fashion, um, how, how, what's the response mechanism as you're rolling out some of these policies as the industry leader where you see competitors start to actually pick it up? I think, uh, well, in this sense, it, last August, it was signed the, what was called the Fashion Pact by more than 50 companies in the um, fashion industry with similar targets uh, to this I am mentioning. And I think everybody is getting more and more conscious in the, in the sector that, that uh, we need to become uh, more and more sustainable. I mean, one thing that's fairly obvious from this conversation is however concerned we are about lack of international coordination, the public sector not moving fast enough, there clearly is not only a lot of initiative, but also yeah. speed and coordination yes. in the private sector. So with that, let's go back up to the model, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask John if he can move a new policy lever, but from the private sector, energy efficiency and electrification and transport and buildings and industry. Let's, let's get some right. efficiency there, because that's so what we're talking about. This captures much of what you just heard about supply chain efficiencies and transport. That helps a, quite a lot. And buildings and industrial processes. And with moderate levels, we're down to 2.9. This matters quite a bit. Energy efficiency, the fastest, safest, cheapest way to get where we want to go. And how does that efficiency track? What, what sort of savings? I mean, if you give just some numbers behind the model there so people can see what we're looking at. You can see the energy intensity of GDP in this bottom right-hand graph. Under the base case, we do assume it continues through the normal technological progress, but the blue line shows what we've been able to do. This is a very significant improvement. Uh, and it, it lags a little because the installed base of existing transport infrastructure and industrial infrastructure is slow to turn over. But we're making quite a large difference here. We're down to 2.9. See, I didn't tell John we were going to do that, but he's very quick on his feet when it comes to this model. Okay, now I'd like to go to the next panel. I want to introduce, if I can, Rachel Duan, President and CEO of GE China, and Wen Shugang, Chairman of China Huarian Group. Please. <laughs> So we've just explored a number of real actions taken by industry to move efficiency and change climate goals. Now I want to talk about the folks that are directly in the energy mix, and particularly here in China, because, of course, the emissions and the future emissions are largely being made here. So with that, Rachel, let me start with you. And I want to ask, talk to us a little bit about where you see the energy mix in China right now. Sure. Well, really what's happening in the changing dynamics of the energy mix has been unprecedented. I think the long dominance of oil and coal is in decline, it's been clear. And I think the renewable is clearly moving from the margin to the mainstreams. There has been nowhere the change is more obvious than here in China. 
So if you're really looking at the energy generation capacity here in China, back in 2000, coal accounts almost for 70%. And this year, we'll go slightly down to 60. And then the government has set very aggressive goal to bring it further down to below 50 or even further down to 30. But in the meantime, renewable goes the opposite directions. So back in 2000, it almost accounts for nothing as of the overall energy generation capacity. However, this year, it jumps to already over 20, 22%. Um, that's mostly in solar and in onshore wind. But with the added on the offshore, I think the goal is really kind of reach the 30% by 2030. Now, I think there are various factors that plays into this, pricing signals and competition between different fields, environmental concerns, including climate change. Um, but also there is technology advancements and the energy diversification as a matter of national securities. What we have seen in China, I think clearly environmental policy plays a key role here. Um, that including limits the construction of the uh, coal-fired factories, uh, as well as subsidies to renewables, uh, and in the meantime, and continue to carry on the power sector reforms. Now, we talked with John at the beginning about the fact that when you're moving on nuclear, you're also pulling back on some of these renewables. How much do you short circuit that trade-off when you're in a country like China that can actually drive policy incentives the way it wants to, if it's willing to pay for it? Well, I actually think uh, uh, Mr. Xi will be in a better position to answer that question from the government perspective. But I think if you're really looking at it, I think these are clearly there's certain rivalries in between the different energies, but there is also a technology feasibility. I think the big question about nuclear, particularly after what's happening in Japan, it's really the safety, the standards, um, but I think there will be a place in nuclear um, in the overall energy mix, that's for sure. The question is how safe, and then also from policy standpoint, uh, how comfortable you are. I, I think uh, um, if you look around the globe, I, I think Europe probably will be mixed. China and India, places that I think they will be continue to see some development. Role of GE in, in participating in that process and optimism as a big global private sector player that you're going to have a greater role over time? Absolutely. You know, GE, uh, we're the largest infrastructure company that in healthcare, aviation, and energy, we in fact um, power one third of the global energy electricity generation. Um, just like what we always do, and first and foremost, we are committed to uh, technology innovation. Um, and in the renewable space, we are bringing some of the best, uh, latest technology in the wind industry. Um, for example, on onshore Cypress uh, platform, and the uh, offshore Halia X platform, they hold the world records of the single unit capacity. And as you know, in the wind in industry, uh, the larger the blades, the larger the rotor size, the higher the tower, the lower the cost. So our innovation has been very much focusing on bringing scale and reducing cost uh, on the renewable space. Um, but not only just the technology pr platform for the turbines, we also invested in new materials and new designs. So the uh, carbon two section blades that we actually implemented in our site first, uh, new platform for onshore, it really addresses um, bring the transportation cost down because the blade usually in that space could be anywhere between 77 meters to 100 meters. It's huge. Um, so I think when we design it, do the, the two-section carbon, it's not lighter, but also in two pieces, so it actually can bring the transportation cost down, but increase the flexibility. But I, I think um, in, in addition to that, we also are committed to making investments in our supply chain footprint, um, both vertically and horizontally. We acquired a, a Blade Businesses LM a couple years ago to really bring that into a renewable business to look at the total cost. Um, but in the meantime, in July this year, we made the announcement uh, to uh, invest in an offshore manufacturing facility in Guangdong, and we just did the groundbreaking last, uh, last week. Uh, is really in, in to support of the overall uh, China offshore wind growth. Now you, in addition to your China role, you have a global role. Yes. I know I didn't introduce it. Uh, but um, when you think about, say, India. Yes. And other emerging markets in the context of what we're discussing here in China, both from GE's perspective and also your view globally, is China just, you have to get China right and everything else is at the margins, or do you see it in a more balanced fashion? Uh, I think it's clearly, I think particularly, it's happening everywhere, particularly in renewable. I think if you really look at renewable uh, as in a major energy ge uh, generation source, globally, when we look at the data, today it accounts for about 9.5% of the total power generation capacity globally. But this number would jump to 30% uh, by 2050. 
Uh, again, I mean, I think, and if you, the other, the other uh, factor you looked at it before, the 10 years before uh, 2010, the major investments in the, uh, in the global renewable sector is mostly in Europe, 50% in Europe, and the other half is split between US and China. But in just in the last decades, over 170 countries around the world have set very aggressive goals to getting into the clean energy, including renewable. But I think in one difference would be, China is a bit more self-sufficient. Um, but in other parts of the world, the biggest challenge is not just addressing climate change or cutting emissions. Um, it's really the big challenge is to addressing climate change, cutting emission, but also meeting the increasing energy demand, including universal access. Because after all, there is still about one billion population in the world does not have access to it, stable electricity. So I think one of the efforts that GE has been really focusing on, in a, particularly in emerging markets outside China, is how do we connect to bring capacity, supply, that means including technology and services, and also financing capability to where the demand is are. So I'll give you one example that we recently finished a wind farm project in Kenya in Africa. It's the second largest uh, uh, wind farm uh, capital projects. So the developer is local, Kenya. Uh, the EPC is a Chinese company, CME, uh, CMEC of Sinomac. Um, GE, as an American company, is the uh, uh, OEM, um, technology and service provider. But the capital financing is led by US, but it's consortium of uh, uh, various banks from the uh, capital markets. So that example shows you today's infrastructure in a lot of the emerging markets, particularly in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia, is cross-regional. Um, not a single play, not a single country um, can really make it happen. I think um, you needed to bring the world capacity and then also financing access to it in order to really lower the cost to address both um, the climate challenge for cutting emission, but in the meantime, to bring access of electricity to uh, where, the, where it needs. Thank you, Rachel, for covering a lot of ground there. And now let me turn it, please, to Mr. Wen. And maybe the first thing I want to ask is, I mean, given the fact that so many people looking at China are impressed and surprised with how much they've been able to accomplish domestically on, say, development of solar and on nuclear over the last 10 years. If we look 10 years in the future, you're one of the biggest energy players in this country. What do you think is going to surprise us? I believe that in future, in terms of uh, energy development, uh, the focus will continue to be the renewables. In the past, in 2006, we implemented the law on renewable uh, energy and we acceded to the Paris Agreement. What we have achieved has been witnessed by all, including the um, uh, um, various kinds of renewables, which have uh, accounted for 39 percent of the total installed capacity. In future, uh, the happy surprise, I think, lies in the uh, application, wider application and upgrading of technologies as a way to reduce the cost of renewables or reduce the threshold of renewables so that clean and renewable technology, energy technologies from China will serve the Chinese market but are also markets in other countries. We can provide experience and technologies in this regard. This will be the focus of our efforts in future. And, and when you think about your partners uh, internationally, uh, as you heard from Rachel, you know, the Chinese are a little more self-sufficient uh, than a lot of these other countries. And frankly, the Chinese are becoming more self-sufficient every day. Um, do you see this sector as being equally open, more open mm -hmm. for international partnership and investment in five, ten years' time than it is right now, and in what way? The Chinese market is always an open market, particularly in the past 40 and 30 years. Richard and I are not the buyer and the supplier relationship. We are also partners. We have used a lot of uh, GE guest to buy, and we just had a meeting with uh, the chairman of GE and. Later on, we may set up more joint adventures with GE. The Chinese side will continue to open itself wider to the world. As President Xi Jinping said, that we will open wider to the world and will continue to do the same. Do you think that um, going forward, as China's capabilities increase, we have to see a lot more export? 
right? And we're already seeing that through Belt and Road. Do you think that China's model is significantly different in the energy mix of its exports now than it is domestically? And do you think that's going to change? The Chinese um, experience can be um, offered to other countries as reference, but it should be combined with local conditions, in, especially in terms of the energy uh, strategy, to see whether these countries are rich in resources, such as oil and gas, or like China and the United States, with a lot of uh, good resources. Uh, Mid -East, Middle East countries have uh, installed a number of um, solar energy equipments so that their renewable energy uh, capacity will be as par with um, the traditional or conventional energy. Well, our experience can be taken as a reference, but we do not export our uh, technologies or experience to other countries. They have to suit their own needs. And I have one question. I have no idea what your answer is going to be, but I'm really interested. If there were one additional piece of policy that you could see from the Chinese government in the next five years that you think would help what you're trying to accomplish, what would it be? I believe that in terms of the renewable energy, in the model of development, we are exploring new models of development, such as uh, scaling up and uh, building up a lot of uh, centers for uh, manufacturing of uh, renewable energy uh, equipments and plants. We have delegated the power of uh, authorization to the local level, such as for 50 uh, thousand kilo, uh, kilowatts and 250 thousand kilowatts uh, installment capacity, so that we will raise our competitiveness in terms of the renewable and the clean energy. The government can uh, encourage the development, but the final say is the market. Quick question for anyone on the first panel. I'm not supposed to do this, but what the hell. Um, given what you've just heard about expectations for China's developments over the course of the next 10 years, what you've heard from renewables, does that change in any way your view of the attractiveness of the Chinese market for your investments? Well, Ch China is already a big market for us. Oh, I know. Uh, and it's, uh, we, we already implemented part of our renewable strategy in China. But listening, that, that's the priority also for the government. Mm -hmm. And ever more of a priority going forward is good news for us. Because not only it makes business sense, but it also go, goes in line with what the Chinese government is trying to accomplish. And um, we learned here in China that one thing that's valued a lot is when we can bring experiences from around the world to China. Because uh, if there is one thing that China does a lot is they're always willing to listen and learn from other people's experience. Great. And more and more they teach the world what to do. So I mean, this is back and forth. So that's something that would be very welcome, like industries like us. Thank you. Industries like Pablo, us. you want to throw one of you? Well, <clears throat> also China for us is a very, very relevant market from every point of view and regarding sustainability and energy, as I was mentioning before, there are many, many initiatives that we are implementing in China as the first market, as it was the eco-efficient store, as it is, for example, delivering our goods through electric vehicles. So we are very much involved in China in everything which has to do with sustainability. And for sure, we will continue for, for many, many years investing and developing our business in China. Okay, now you've forgotten about John, but he's still there. And so we need his model back. <laughs> and I mean, from this panel, it's pretty clear that one thing we are going to see from China is a lot more renewables, right? And so given that, and given other changes in mixes in emerging markets around the world, um, what's an effective way to policy lever we can pull that's gonna show us that change? Well, what I heard was uh, additional subsidies and other means to promote renewables, so let's do that. And you see that green wedge of renewables grows pretty substantially and it's squeezing out some of the nuclear now. So it uh, by itself isn't making a huge difference, but if we couple that with electrification of vehicles and of the buildings and industrial processes, heat pumps, et cetera, now we're down to 2.7. So that mattered quite a lot, the policies that the panel just suggested. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So, I mean, you know, again, we're not there, and we're certainly not at 1.5, but no one thought we were going to be at 1.5. Uh, but let me turn to the audience now. We actually are meant to be a little interactive here. Um, and I want to start uh, with Rupa uh, Purushottaman, who is the chief economist for Tata Sons. And I believe she's right here. Is that right? Yes, she is. So she has um, a question. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that. Um, so I feel that much of the hope in the climate change conversation seems to rest on us finding some breakthroughs in this new technology that you mentioned. Can we really get to where we need to go if, for whatever reason, these new technologies don't seem to come to pass? Right. So that is a great question because there's a lot of risk in assuming that there's going to be a major technical breakthrough that gives us zero carbon energy cheaper than coal. Model back up, please. Let's keep it up. Yeah, let's bring the model up. And so let's see what happens if we look at a scenario where we don't have that magical breakthrough. So I'll take that away entirely. And it didn't change the temperature at all. In other words, we don't need to assume a magical technical breakthrough because what happened when you took it away is you get even more renewables. Look at the size of that green wedge of wind and solar and the storage to go with it and geothermal and heat pumps, et cetera. This is really an important insight, so great question. Thank you. Now, Bill's in the green room, so he's listening to this right now, and I want him, when he comes out, to tell us if and why we're wrong about this because let's, I'd like to get some hope about it. Okay, now let me look to the mayor of Helsinki, Jan Vapavori, uh, who is right here in the front row. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. The city of Helsinki has a commitment to become carbon neutral by 2035. And that's why I'm asking what would be the impact if all cars in the world were electric by 2035? So this is a fantastic question. Uh, there's no way to get all the cars on the road to be electric because the, by 2035 because the average life of vehicles in the United States and similar in Europe and the rest of the world is 16 years. So that's 2035 already, and only about half the cars would be switched over by that point, even if 100% of all sales from today were electric. But let's incentivize further electrification of vehicles. Mm. And it doesn't make a huge difference. It helped a little bit. You could see the Fahrenheit temperature drop just a tad there. Uh, further efficiency in vehicles would also help somewhat. Now, what you suggest is critical for saving lives by reducing the ground level air pollution. So we must do this for public health. But uh, it's not a magic bullet on the climate side. And one more intervention from Lord Nicholas Stern, right there on my left. Mm. Thank you very much for a wonderful panel. I, I want to suggest to, to John that the argument that there's a trade-off between climate responsibility and growth is just wrong. But you have to go beyond your model to show it. If that drive gives you cities where you can move and breathe and be productive, if it gives you innovation, if it gives you strong natural capital, then this drive to zero carbon is the growth story of this century. So uh, I'm in complete agreement with this. Uh, but in order to break that alleged trade-off, we have to get the carbon out of the energy system as fast as possible. Not only because it limits the damage, but because it drives the innovation that you're talking about and the investment and the job creation and the improvements in public health. So as you have written before, climate change is the greatest market failure in the history of humanity. So we can correct much of that with a larger carbon price. So let's implement an even larger carbon price than we've seen so far. And that mattered a lot. We're now down to 2.4. But it's not the only market failure or barrier. So what we're going to need to do here is some additional effort. We're going to need much more efficiency in the buildings and industrial processes, more electrification of our buildings. We're going to need to cut deforestation. We're going to need to improve afforestation. And we heard about this from Minister Xi. We're going to need even more reduction in the emissions from land and ag. And here we are now at two degrees. We have done it. You've created a much safer future for yourselves and your children. And if we are lucky enough to get the major technological breakthrough, which we all hope for as an MIT professor, I desperately want that to happen. But I don't want to bake the assumption of a technological miracle into our base scenario. So 
If that happens, great. And if it also happens that we can get significant technical breakthroughs for carbon dioxide removal technologies, some of which we can do today through land and ag policies and perhaps BEX and biochar, now we're down to 1.8. This is a much safer world. It is possible, and when we do this, faster economic growth will not have a trade-off against the climate. Thank you very much, Sean. Now, uh, Mr. Shi, you, you, Special Envoy, uh, I, you wanted to make a point, and I'm certainly going to allow you to do it. So please, an intervention. For the two questions, I think we should approach the two questions in such a way that, first of all, we need to set a global and a national um, emission reduction goals. Uh, globally, if you want to control the price rise to two degrees, then by 2027, 20, global emissions will reach zero, that is, we will reach carbon neutral. If you want to achieve 1.5 degrees, then it means that by the year 2050, global CO2 emissions will reach zero, that is, carbon neutral. So with this goal in mind, it creates a market, and the technology and financial resources flow are clear. So generally, people now have these um, estimates. If we ensure the two degrees um, as stipulated by Paris Agreement, then probably by 2025, the world needs $9 trillion market, and China wants to achieve the 2030 uh, goal, we need 41 trillion RMB of a market in terms of market size. With such a market, companies, uh, research institutes know where their technology and uh, financial resources can go to. Apart from setting goals, the government can also introduce relevant economic policies, encouraging certain things and banning certain things. So it uses market approaches as well. And as has been mentioned, the carbon market, uh, of course, in item or Article 6 of Paris Agreement, it was stipulated that the world should set up a carbon emissions trading mechanism. And in this year's COP meeting, this mechanism will be continued to be improved. It's key that uh, pricing of carbon should be deliberate, uh, should be discussed fully. Until now, actually, around the world, the carbon market is largest in China. And for the regions already with carbon emission trading systems, they're not so successful in the EU. Uh, their price has dropped from uh, three z uh, euro to t uh, two zero, and they have cancelled the um, quotas, and uh, now they want to reach 35 uh, euros, and they want to further re increase it to 100 euros. So uh, it's a process. You need to make innovations in technologies and uh, governance systems. So are we on this path now? No. Um, is there a silver bullet? No. Can we bring the uh, model back up just so people can see that? Sure. I mean, there's an awful lot Thank in you. the policy mix here. Um, but there's also no question that whether we take these steps or whether we don't, climate is one of the very few issues out there that's actually bringing the world closer together. And I, I think that's precisely the reason that we've had not only such strong participation, but also such transparency and lively discussion on this panel. So I certainly hope um, that we can make some of the moves that'll get us on a more sustainable, even if not optimistic future. And I thank my panel, and I hope that all of you will join me in thanking them. Thank you very much. Thank you.